called me, taught my sinful heart and mine, else this world had still enthralled me, and to glory kept me blind. Lord, I did not freely choose you, till by grace you set me free, for my heart would still refuse you, had your love not chosen me. Good morning. Welcome to the Church of St. Paul and the Redeemer on Sunday, October 18, 2020, as we celebrate the 20th Sunday in the season of Pentecost. Our worship this morning will follow morning prayer right to, from the Book of Common Prayer of the Episcopal Church. But you'll find everything you need to participate in today's service in the subtitles at the bottom of your screen. Today, during worship, you'll get to hear from a speaker for our Glad and Generous Hearts Fall Stewardship Campaign. And I encourage you, if you haven't already done so, to pledge your membership in the church in 2021 by going to sprchicago.org giving. Whether you come from near or far, whether you're a new visitor or a longtime member, we are so glad to be worshiping with you today and hope that you will join us in living out our mission to mirror the radical hospitality practiced by Jesus. Most of all, welcome. And may God bless you as we keep finding new ways to worship together, even while we are geographically apart. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Mother of us all, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen.
approach with a joy his courts unto his Lord and bless his name always for it is seemly so and righteousness in Jacob. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and fall down before his footstool. He is the Holy One. Proclaim, proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God. He is the Holy One. Moses and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among those who call upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them out of the pillar of cloud. They kept his testimonies and the decree that he gave them. Proclaim, proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God. you answered them indeed. You were a God who forgave them, yet punished them for their evil deeds. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and worship him upon his holy hill. For the Lord our God is the Holy One. Proclaim, proclaim the greatness of the Lord. A reading from the book of Exodus. Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, 
I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways, so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. He said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go, do not carry us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? In this way we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Show me your glory, I pray. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim, your, proclaim before you the name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, See, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the book of Matthew. The Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with the truth, and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us, then, what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this, and whose title? 
They answered, The emperors. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Mother of us all. Amen. I remember the day that I realized that my mom had a life that had nothing to do with me. I was in kindergarten and it was a really special day because my mom was dropping me off at school. And as she walked me to my classroom, we crossed paths with Mrs. Seckington, our school principal. I was terrified of this woman. All powerful in the eyes of this five-year-old, she seemed to run my tiny world with an iron fist. And yet, unafraid, my mother walked right up to her like she knew her. Because, in fact, she did. You see, my mother was also an elementary school principal in the city where I grew up. So I watched in awe as they talked to each other about a work life that consumed so much of my mother's existence and was wholly other from the mom I knew. It was at that point 
that my little brain began to make a distinction between the Mrs. Geidel that so many elementary school students knew as their principal and the mom who tucked me in at night. This was the beginning of an exercise in complexity that humans are required to engage in and do so with varying degrees of success. I had to hold two seemingly incongruent truths at once. My mom could both be my mom and someone else's principal at the same time. She could know other kids who were not my friends. She was a whole person outside of the person who I had spent my life knowing. It blew my mind. And these types of facts continue to blow our minds well into adulthood. We can see our pets as absolutely perfect and acknowledge the fact that their habit of jumping on people is obnoxious. Our government both maintains the facets of life that keep the day-to-day -day relatively manageable and continues to make decisions that are not in the best interest of the people they serve. People can be good and do awful things. Multiple realities can be true at once. We as Christians profess to know a little something about this, or at least our God knows a whole lot about it. Fully human and fully divine, Jesus stands in the messy middle ground where multiplicity thrives. He surrounds himself with the lowest of the low, prostitutes, tax collectors, and sinners of all stripes, and promises that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. We confess that death is real and has power and yet cannot overcome us, because our God of multiplicity proved that both can be true simultaneously. Christians have committed to a life of holding multiple realities in tension, believing that many things can be real and true at the same time. And it is entrenched in this reality that we find Jesus in our gospel story today. The Pharisees and the Herodians, two adversarial groups united in their hatred of Jesus, come to him with one purpose. Entrapment. They meet Jesus among his followers to put him to the test, forcing him to choose between God and the empire. The law and the gospel. The question is simple. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? If he were to say that it is not lawful to pay taxes, for all should be given to God, Jesus would be putting the lives of his followers at risk. For withholding taxes from Rome was punishable by torture and death. On the other hand, if he were to say it was lawful to be paying taxes, Jesus would be going against his disciples and friends who lived under the oppressive forces of the emperor, striving to disentangle from his powerful rule. In the eyes of his tempters, Jesus is left with no answer. Every option before him is betrayal. But his answer surprises them. Give, therefore, to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. What? In this story with only terrible options, Jesus picked both of them and somehow got the right answer. Because in the mind of God, these two truths can be held at once. Between binaries and multiplicity, multiplicity is the better answer. But what does it mean? What is Jesus trying to tell us when he says to give to the emperor what is the emperor's and to God what is God's? In this statement, Jesus stands firmly between the world as it is and the world as it should and will be. As Christians, we don't believe in magic. 
We don't believe in being whooshed away from our problems and off to another land. We believe in a God who came down to earth to be with us in our reality. To join in our humanity and help us build what is to come. Build the kingdom. As we read the Gospels, we are painted a picture of holding these two worlds in tension. What is and what will be. We hear stories in the, of Jesus in the messiest parts of being human. In blood and illness and death. In pain and heartache. We also see Jesus joyfully attending weddings and dinners with friends. We see him living fully in the world as it is and teaching his disciples how to be better followers of God as they live their daily lives. But we also see glimpses of the world as it should and will be. The glory of Moses and Elijah glowing in splendor on the mountaintop. Moments of prayer where Jesus teaches his followers about connecting to the God who made them. The mystery of life overcoming death again and again and again to lead us back to the splendor of our loving God. We are taught through the life of Jesus that both can be real and true simultaneously. The pain and complexity of the world as it is, and the majesty of the world as it should and will be. And Jesus is calling us in our gospel story today that we must stand directly in the middle, holding these two truths in tension. The truth of who we are, and the truth of who we may become. So this is our call. To be faithful to a God of multiplicity. Standing firmly in the messy middle ground. Believing multiple things to be real and true at once. The world is filled with heartache. And it is also beautiful. We hurt one another and make our lives hard. And we are also created in the image and likeness of an all-knowing, all-loving God. This life is devastating. And it is so good. And our God calls us to stand right there. To take it all in. To give to this life all that we have and to labor alongside our God in creating the kingdom that is to come. For we were created for the complexity of this life. And our God is right here. Meeting us in it. Amen. Good morning, SPR. My name is Shannon Kate, and I've been a member of this community since 2009. I first came to Chicago then <clears throat> from Champaign-Urbana and the first thing I did was not look for a place to live but go on the website of the Chicago Diocese and start looking for a church. At the time what I was looking for was a place where my children who were three and one, they were three and one, could grow up surrounded by um, a chosen family of extended relations with particularly African-American adults and children and others um, because my children are transracially adopted. And so when I started looking at parishes on the diocesan website, I started sending emails to the rectors of these parishes and say to them, 
I'm a white woman with adopted black daughters. Is there anyone like us at your church? I knew that they would all say that we were welcome at their churches, but I was concerned that we not stick out and be the only people like us, that my children not be the only black people, uh, the only people who had queer parents. So uh, I got two responses back from rectors that I emailed to and subsequently met a rector um, at another church who all told me, you should go to SPR. So I did. And here we are. Um, The lovely thing about SPR for me has always been that I don't have to leave any part of myself outside the door. I can bring everything about myself into the church and be among people who care about me and who I care about and who care about my family and my children in particular. There's not necessarily a lot of people at SPR who are exactly like me or families who are exactly like my family, but there's a lot of overlap and there are a lot of people at SPR who aren't really like anyone else. So it's an experience that a lot of us share that we're different from the others around us in many other parts of our lives. Uh, There are also a lot of refugees from other faith traditions at SPR, not as many cradle Episcopalians as many churches have. I'm not a cradle Episcopalian. I have been one for the bulk of my life so far, but I was not born and raised in the Episcopal Church. So I find that we're a really unique community, even though not a lot of people are exactly the same. One of the important things about SPR to me has always been its unusual racial diversity. I kind of thought that I would probably just end up raising my kids in a black church, which makes sense because the churches in the United States are very segregated. I was really pleased to find that there was a place that was integrated that had people of different races in the same church, the way we had that in our family, that that would be actually a really good thing for my kids to see. But that diversity that I really do treasure is definitely not enough. And one of the things that I value the most about SPR is that we're trying to get better and better at this racial justice stuff. Um, I recently, last year, um, joined the anti-racist working group of our church. Um, This is a group that isn't just about looking for the proper liturgy to celebrate on Martin Luther King Day or um, inviting a guest speaker here and there. This is a group that's seriously, thoughtfully, sometimes painfully working to dismantle the white supremacy that is at the core of our church because it's at the core of our culture. And unless you dismantle it, it will be there. Lately, there's been this thing going around Facebook about denouncing white supremacy. And I've seen a lot of people posting that they denounce white supremacy. I mean, I guess I'm glad people denounce white supremacy. It's better than not denouncing it, like some people in this country. But you can't denounce something like white supremacy any more than you can denounce oxygen. It's not a personal thing. White supremacy is with us because, historically, the idea of race was invented by Europeans who wanted to conquer the world and exploit other people and land and resources. And so that's where the idea of race came from at all. Whiteness, race, is necessarily systemic, not individual. It's pervasive. And we can't simply denounce something 
that we then walk outside our door into a world that's so full of it and we still carry it within us whether we want to or not. As Christians and as Episcopalians, we are commanded by our baptismal covenant that when we fall into sin, we don't simply denounce it, though we do, but we repent. And the word repent is not, doesn't just mean feel bad or do penance. The word repent literally means turn around and go in the opposite direction. Do the opposite of what you've been doing. Don't just be sorry. The anti-racist working group is mandated by our parish to figure out how we at SPR can go in the opposite direction of white supremacy. And how SPR, having grown in that way, can perhaps lead our community in the opposite direction of white supremacy. Now, I don't want anyone to misunderstand me. The opposite of white supremacy isn't the supremacy of a different race. The opposite of white supremacy is God's kingdom. I said kingdom, not kingdom. That's a little feminist trick I learned in seminary, but I still really like it. The kinship of God's people on earth. It's the beloved community spoken of by Martin Luther King. It's a world in which we bear one another's burdens. And here at SPR, there have been a lot of burdens to bear lately. We've done a lot of bearing of them, and I'm very proud of our community and some of the people in it who've, who've led some of that work to really just help people at the basic level of need right now. But it's been a difficult year, and I'll be honest with you. I don't have a lot to pledge this year. I haven't had a lot to pledge the past few years, but I always do pledge. And the reason I pledge, instead of just putting money in the offering plate when I think of it or write a check, I pledge. Because pledging is a way for me to stand up and be recognized as a member of this community. It's a way for me to really put myself up and say, I'm in this for the long haul with you. I'm in here. I'm together with everyone here. And maybe after I fulfilled my pledge, I'll be able to give some more. But I'm always going to pledge, even if it's a small amount. And I think it's important to see those numbers, those percentages of the number of people who pledge. Not the amount, but the percentage of people who are saying, I'm in this for the long haul. I'm with you. This is my church. So I hope that you will all join me this year in making a pledge. Maybe it'll be the first time you've ever done it. Maybe it'll be less this year than it was last year. But I just hope that everyone will come together in a time like this and say, we're far apart physically, but we will always be a beloved community and we will always be a church. God bless you all. Let us confess the faith of the church. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Creator God, we pray for your holy Catholic Church that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. We give thanks for Isla, Julian, Edward, Sage, Roger, Victoria, Jamila, Lars, and Elaine as they begin another year. And for Cara and Jerome and Jim and Val as they celebrate their anniversaries. Give them grace to do your will in all that they undertake, that their works may find favor in your sight. We pray for Chloe, Josiah, Deborah, Charles, Pauline, Bill, Gladys, Ethan, Christine, Doritha, Carol, James, Marion, Joseph, Sally and her family, Eli, Rock, William, Cheryl, Henry, Sophie, Naomi, George, Sean, Tim, William, Jewel, Leatrice, Bronwyn, Chris, and Barbara as well as their caregivers. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble that they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. We remember especially Nathalene. Let light perpetual shine upon her. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in their heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. I invite your intercessions and thanksgivings, either silently or aloud. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, in Christ you have revealed your glory among the nations. Preserve the works of your mercy, that your church throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in the confession of your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church, 
and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Greater will 